Joining us now is Dr. Robert Putnam, the uh, author of Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis. And uh, thanks very much for being with us. We appreciate it. Thanks. It's great to, be, great to be with you. You talk a lot about the opportunity gap that exists for children in America today between more affluent and poorer kids. Can you describe that gap for us? Sure. It shows up in a very wide range of uh, measures or indicators of the resources that kids have, that rich kids have and poor kids have, and the opportunities that are open to rich kids and poor kids. When I say rich and poor, I don't mean you know, Bill Gates or, or Warren Buffett's kids compared to some street people. I'm talking about basically the gap is between college educated, kids coming from college educated homes and kids coming from high school educated homes. That gap between kids from sort of upper or upper middle backgrounds and kids coming from what we used to call the working class, those gaps are growing in terms of the amount of money that parents spend on their kids for high quality daycare or piano lessons or summer camp. It shows up in the amount of time parents are able to spend with their kids reading to them what we call good night moon time, which is up rapidly for kids coming from well-educated homes and not so much for kids coming from poorer homes. It shows up in family stability, uh, whether people are living in a stable two-parent home or, or not. Um, it shows up in uh, differences in the quality of schools kids go to. It shows up in even in things like um, uh, church attendance, involvement in religious communities, which is, that, which is declining much more rapidly among working class kids. And that concerns me not as a theological matter, but because churches represent the kinds of social connections that used to help all kids in town, and now the poor kids are just not in those networks. It, the same gap shows up in mentoring, the amount of support kids get from, gets from other, other parts of the community. Um, it shows up in who's able to complete college. It shows up in test scores. Test scores are up for rich kids and down for poor kids. Um, it shows up very early in life. Most of the gaps are fully formed before kids even get to school. So it's not just, it's not actually mainly things that the schools are doing or not doing to kids. It's things that happen to the kids before they even get uh, to school. It means that we are increasingly across the country in all sorts of communities becoming more polarized. I'm not talking about in political terms, but I'm talking in, in, in economic and opportunity terms. And that is so important in our country because historically, Americans haven't cared very much about the distribution of income, whether people are rich or poor, but they have cared about whether everybody gets a fair start. The, the basic idea that all kids should have a fair start in life, regardless of what their parents did, that is at the core of American identity. When we announced our our independence to the world. The first thing we said to the world was, we believe that all men are created equal. Now, of course, at the time, we didn't quite mean all men. We meant white men, and we meant men. We didn't mean women. But the, the core idea that everybody gets a fair start in life isn't just some accidental belief. This is actually what it means to be American. And as that is becoming less true, this is a big problem for America, not just a big national problem. It is that. It's a problem that I hope and believe increasingly national candidates, the candidates for national audience will be asked their views, but it's also a problem in local communities all across America. And so community organizations, churches, and above all school boards should be asking themselves, what can I do here in this town to try to narrow that opportunity gap? Educators and school board members are very familiar with the gap that exists among kids entering kindergarten, and uh, you are a big proponent of early childhood education as a way to close that gap, aren't you? That's right. Um, you know, Americans have a habit of blaming schools for everything that goes wrong. And one of the things that I say in the, in the new book, Our Kids, is this is not a problem. The growing opportunity gap is not a problem that schools caused. Very little of this is caused by anything directly under schools' control. It is a problem that we hope schools can help fix. That's a different issue because historically, Americans have used our big investments in education. Americans have invested heavily in education for more than 100 years, high schools and community colleges and colleges and elementary schools and so on. We've done that. We said we were doing that so that all kids got a fair start. And 
Therefore, it is incumbent upon all of us to try to help schools close the gap without blaming schools for the fact, uh, fact of the, the gap is something kids bring into schools from their neighborhoods, from their homes, from their communities. They're bringing that gap in and schools are then faced with the question, okay, what can we do to help narrow this gap? You also talk about the importance of extracurricular activities, especially for poorer kids. And uh, you also are pretty outspoken in your opposition to pay for play policies where students actually have to pay to participate in extracurricular activities. Why are extracurricular activities so important? Well, the extracurricular activities were not invented by God. They were invented by educational reformers in the Midwest around 1910. God did not invent, you know, high school football. It was invented by people, school people, who said, right, we've got to have, we've got to teach kids reading, writing, arithmetic, and we also need to teach them what we nowadays would call soft skills, character building, grit, um, uh, delayed gratification, teamwork, all of those things that, frankly, I learned playing football. I mean, I'm a lousy football player, but the good taxpayers of my hometown, Port Clinton, Ohio, paid for my spikes, paid for my pads, paid for my helmet, paid for the Friday night lights, so that I, just like every other kid in town, could learn those character skills, those teamwork skills. And, and the taxpayers in those years and the first and for most of the 20th century paid for that for everybody because it wasn't thought to be a frill. This was part of what it meant to be an educated person. And it pays off. We know that kids who've been involved in extra activities do better in life. The data are quite clear. They earn higher salaries because employers are willing to pay more for people who have those soft skills, who know how to work in teams, who know how to take one for the, the team. So when schools about across the country about 20 years ago began charging kids to take part in extracurricular, extracurricular activities through pay for play policies, that was frankly really dumb because it was perfectly predictable that if you started charging kids, now nationwide it's about $400 per sport or ter per semester per kid. So if you've got two kids and they want to take part in a fall and winter sport or band or chorus or French club, whatever, that's for a family $1,600. If your family has an annual income of $200,000, $1,600 is nothing. But if your family has an income of $16,000 a year, would you imagine, nobody would imagine spending 10% of their total family income on extracurricular activities. And, and schools, some school boards or school superintendents sometimes say, well, that's okay, we've got a waiver. If you're poor, you don't have to pay. But that doesn't, papers, sorry, waivers are not worth the paper they're written on. We know this from hard research. Kids perfectly reasonably are afraid of being stigmatized. They don't want to raise their hand and say, I'm the poor kid in town who can't afford to play football, so they dropped out, and the data show exactly that that's happened. Rich kids are not dropping out of extracurriculars. Poor kids across the country are dropping out of extracurriculars because we're charging them for it. And that is completely un-American. I mean that in the deepest sense. That's not the way we do things in America. You don't get special privileges just because your parents are rich. Mm -hmm. When it comes to addressing some of these issues, uh, Dr. Putnam, you talk about recognizing the issues nationally, but solving them locally. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that there have been previous periods in American history when we have faced problems like this. Uh, for example, at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, the last time we had what was called a gilded age in which there were big gaps between rich and poor kids and a high rate of immigration and a sense of political corruption and political uh, intrigue and so on, there was a national conversation about reforms. It was led by people like Teddy Roosevelt and Jane Addams and so on. But the hard work of innovating, of finding actual practical solutions, didn't come from Washington, D.C. and didn't come from Cambridge, Massachusetts, that is where I work and teach at Harvard. They came from places like Toledo and Galveston, and Kansas, and the Wyoming territories, where there were people who were given oxygen by the national debate. The national debate said, you're right, there is a problem here. But having been encouraged by that national conversation, they then began to find solutions that worked in Oshkosh, or worked in Toledo. 
And those, the good ideas from those local experiments spread very rapidly across the country because if you discover a good idea, other school boards are likely to follow you. So I think that's the way we're going to solve this problem. This is not, my total perspective here is, uh, this is not saying, oh, we ought to be like Sweden or something like that. I'm saying we ought to be like America. And the way America solves problems like this, has always solved problems like this, in small towns across the middle of this country, is to figure out how can we help all the kids in town? When we invented high schools at the turn of the last century, around 1910, it was invented in places in small towns in Kansas and Iowa and this part of the country where people said, look, we'd be better off if all the kids in town, all the kids in town, had a chance at free secondary education. It turned out to be the best single investment that America ever made. And those ideas were not coming out of national affairs. They were coming out of the hard work of local decision makers. Local decision makers, however, who were concerned about all the kids in town and not just their own kids. Dr. Putnam, you also talk about uh, in our culture today we have a shriveled sense of we. What do you mean by that? When I was growing up in Port Clinton, Ohio, and my parents used the expression our kids, when they said you know, we've got to have a bond issue here so that our kids can have a swimming pool at, at high school. Or we've got to, you know, pay higher taxes so that our kids can learn French at high school. All these highfalutin things. When they said that, when my parents used the term our kids, they didn't mean my sister Elaine and me. They meant all the kids in town. And my parents kept voting for those things long after I was long gone and my sister were long gone. In that era, in America, and not just in Port Clinton, when people use the expression, our kids, they meant all the kids in town. But nowadays, because over the last 30 or 40 years, our sense of we has shriveled to an I. And nowadays, when people talk about our kids, we've got to do something for our kids, they mean my biological kids. And, and if you go back to Port Clinton and talk about poor kids in town now, People say, I don't know, she's not my kid. She must be somebody else's kid. Let them worry about her. That is fundamentally un-American. That's not the way we solved our problems. And I think in solving this problem of the growing opportunity gap between rich kids and poor kids, it isn't so hard to think of things that might make a difference. The most, the most difficult challenge is going to be for us to overcome this focus on the I instead of the we. Dr. Robert Putnam, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you.